Okay, now, this is psychologically, I think, pretty complex. And it doesn't all reflect all that well on Hector, and I think that's part of the genius of the Bard of Book Six, because Hector is thinking about his own honor and the kleos that he's going to get after he's dead from the fact that Andromache is someone else and people are pointing at her and saying that she's the wife of Hector. And when Hector says, may I be dead, I think the Bard of Book Six is kind of encoding a very complex psychology. That is... After I die, I am trying to make sure that I'm going to have this honor, this theme. And the antagonism that uh, exists between Achilles and Hector, along with uh, the various divine superstructures, especially the antagonism between Athena and Hector, as we see it in Book 6, which is when the women are bringing the special garment to Athena to try to get her not to destroy Troy, and it's in vain. Um, all of that uh, results in a, a very interesting psychological situation that the Bard of Book Six is proposing. That is, Hector is in a doomed cause. He absolutely knows he's going to die, um, and yet he still, and this is my favorite part about Hector, he's much more mortal than Achilles. He still has hope. He still hopes the way real people do, that maybe he won't be dead, and yet when he thinks of his death, he is thinking in terms of Dime. And if you want to kind of bring down the psychology, the psychology of the Iliad as it's reflected in this tragedy of Hector, and of course the last uh, thing that happens in the Iliad is the funeral of Hector. If you want to bring it all down, it is all about how warriors, heroes, the people who are going to be the subjects of hero cult, which results in a sociology out of this psychology, all of that comes down to honor. And Hector decides, and this is the moment when he decides not to flee away from Achilles, but rather to face him down, and he knows he's going to die. Uh, when Hector decides to do that, he shows us that for the bards of the Iliad, honor is the most important thing, psychologically and sociologically. Um, and the psyche of a hero like Hector within the framework of what the bards of the Iliad are able to accomplish psychologically revolves around that concept. That is, when I die, my honor is going to live on, and that's what matters, and my psychology is constructed in such a way as to value that above all other things. Now, as we're going to see, it's different in the Odyssey. The moment in the Odyssey that I want to look at is in Book 19 on page 288 in the Lattimore translation. And Odysseus has just told the last of the Cretan lies to Penelope to convince her that he, in fact, does know Odysseus and saw Odysseus. Um, and uh, he tells a story about how he saw Odysseus on Crete, and he describes him in such a way that Penelope will believe that he, in fact, has seen Odysseus. Um, and it goes like this. He spoke and still more aroused in her the passion for weeping, as she recognized the certain proofs Odysseus had given. But when she had taken her pleasure of tearful lamentation, then once again she spoke to him and gave him an answer. Stranger, while before this you had my pity, you now shall be my friend and be respected here in my palace. For I myself gave him this clothing as you describe it, I folded it in my chamber, and I, too, attached the shining pin to be his adornment. But I shall never welcome him home, come back again to the beloved land of his fathers. It was on a bad day for him that Odysseus boarded his hollow ship for that evil not to be mentioned Ilion. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, O respected wife of Odysseus, son of Laertes, no longer waste your beautiful skin, nor eat your heart out in lamentation for your husband. Yet I do not blame you, for any woman mourns when she loses her wedded husband, with whom she has lain in love and borne children, even a lesser man than Odysseus. They say that he was like the immortals. But now give over your lamentation and mark what I tell you, for I say to you without deception, without concealment, that I have heard of the present homecoming of Odysseus. He is near in the rich land of the men of Thesprosia and alive and bringing many treasures back to his household. Okay, so this encounter, which is in a certain way a mirror of the encounter in Book 6 between Hector and Andromache, a hero and his wife, 
um, is also in that same sense an opposite of it, a kind of mirrored reflection. Because here uh, Odysseus is saying that he is going to come home. Troy is being called by Penelope evil and not to be mentioned. Um, and in Book Six in the Iliad, Hector is saying to Andromache, "I would rather be dead." Right? If we're going to have to go through with this kind of Iliadic psychology. The psychology of the Odyssey is about Odysseus coming home. And if you read Book 19 the way I think the bards expect their audiences to listen to it, what you see from this point on is a back and forth between Odysseus and Penelope um, that's very unlike the, the very stilted back and forth between Hector and Andromache in Iliad 6. And uh, a view of the intimacy of Odysseus and Penelope that includes, I believe, the sense that uh, Penelope knows that it's Odysseus, and Odysseus may know that Penelope knows that it's Odysseus. Um, and they're sending these kind of coded under the surface messages back and forth that convey uh, an intimacy that has to do with exactly what Odysseus is talking about there in his reply to Penelope, the intimacy between a husband and a wife, which is the very um, strongly emphasized goal of Odysseus coming home, whether we want to bring in the idea of the double standard with Calypso and Circe uh, or not. Nevertheless, Odysseus is clearly coming home to Penelope, and Penelope here in Book 19 proves herself to be very much his equal. And that psychology is, I think, utterly different, but also uh, completely an answer to the psychology of the Iliad. The psychology of war, as we see in the Iliad, the psychology that uh, heroes are oriented on their insides towards getting honor, is kind of thrown over, above all by the fact of Odysseus as a crafty guy, a guy who tells lies. And here, in that same moment, when he talks about the intimacy between husband and wife, he's also talking about the fact that he is telling her the absolute truth, when, of course, he is not telling her the absolute truth. And when he says that Odysseus is in Thesprosia, He's lying um, and maybe hoping that she's going to see through the lie because as it goes on, you can see that they're kind of taking positions uh, opposed to one another. And finally, when Penelope proposes the contest of the bow, I think if you're reading it right, it's Penelope kind of sending a message to Odysseus, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Um, if you are going to come home, if you're not going to be the Hector kind of hero, if that's not your psychology, then you're going to have to do this, and you're going to have to claim me um, as you should, and otherwise I'm just going to go marry one of the suitors because, and here we get from psychology into sociology, that Hector type of hero, that Achilles type of Hector, that Achilles type of hero is no good in this situation. Here we are in Ithaca, the war is over, if you're going to come home, you have to come home. And so it's a psychology that encompasses both genders as opposed to the kind of inherently masculine psychology of the Iliad as well. And I think taking the two together is a wonderful way of looking at how differently uh, what's more or less a single tradition can configure its psychology and its sociology. And so when we move into video games, what we're going to be looking for is whether we can find um, different psychologies and sociologies within the tradition of the adventure video game, um, maybe within individual games as they allow their characters, their players, to explore different versions of what it means to be a person within the game, and through that exploration, what it means to be a person within the quote-unquote real world.